Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Thoreau. I'm the privileged to be the president of the C.S. Lewis Society of California. I want to welcome you to the second meeting that we're having on Jordan Peterson's book, The Twelve Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, we're thrilled to have Paul Vanderclay again as our leader, discussant leader and moderator. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. For those of you who are new to the C.S. Lewis Society, um, you can go to our website, lewissociety.org, to get further information. Uh, we have a number of our board members here, uh, which we're pleased to, uh, to and privileged to have on our board and also to participate very actively. Um, on the Lewis Society website, you'll find uh, virtually all of Lewis's books and virtually every book about Lewis and many other writers who have contributed to these, these seminal questions and ideas. Uh, that range from philosophical, cultural, theological, economic, uh, literary, and many other aspects pertaining to major questions that people have and have had um, since the beginning. Uh, there's also information about becoming a member of the Lewis Society. This is how we fund these kinds of events. Um, our, U our YouTube channel, uh, you're welcome to subscribe. We'll have this video as well as the previous one up soon. So um, some of you may recall that um, on May, May 2nd, we had the privilege of hosting an event in San Francisco with Jordan Peterson. It was a sold out event at the Marines Memorial Theater. And the topic of the evening was called An Evening with Jordan B. Peterson, The Meaning and Reality of Individual Sovereignty. And I think people really enjoy that. And uh, Paul was also there. Um, and also hosted a meetup group beforehand, which we were delighted that that was possible. Um, Paul is a pastor at Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church. He went to Calvin College and Calvin Seminary. And uh, his own YouTube channel, I, ha I highly recommend, where he discusses Peterson's work and Lewis's work and so forth. So don't let me delay any further. I want to introduce Paul Vanderclay. Well, it's my pleasure to be back, and you might recall those of you who are here on the 5th, I'm going to, we went through the 12 rules a little bit in the last video. I'm going to go in a little bit more depth tonight, and tonight I want to talk about the pagan and the Christian. One of the, one of the big issues that comes up again and again in the Jordan Peterson conversation is how to categorize him. Esther O'Reilly is a blogger, and she, while I do YouTube channels, she often blogs, and her characterization of Jordan Peterson has been a noble pagan. And, and I think that's actually a fairly good, a fairly good categori categorization of him. I often call him the unauthorized exorcist, but, but noble pagan, especially for tonight's conversation, I think is quite apt. In YouTube land, it's always a hot conversation to ask the question, is Jordan Peterson a Christian? Uh, Jonathan Peugeot, who knows Jordan Peterson quite well, and Jordan, Jonathan Peugeot is an orthodox icon carver, calls Jordan Peterson Cyrus. He says he's a heretic. He's his good friend, but doesn't necessarily categorize him as a Christian. Anytime I do a YouTube video, asking this question, the comments will be all over the place. He, Jordan Peterson hops back and forth over the line often. Sometimes if you ask him if he's a Christian, he'll say yes. Sometimes he'll say no. He doesn't go to church. And Jordan Peterson's terminology can be sort of all over the map because he even, in fact, accused Matt Delahunty and Sam Harris of in some ways being Christians, which they didn't really appreciate. And so a lot of it depends on what you mean by a Christian. And we won't necessarily debate that this evening, but it's in the back of our minds as we think about this question about what is Jordan Peterson trying to do with this book, 12 Rules for Life? Now the isn't or isn't he question, I, always, I often think of it in terms of Jim and Pam in the office. And actually one of my earlier videos, 
I did an analysis of Jordan Peterson via the characters in the office, and this was the only video that I know Jordan Peterson, a video of mine that I know Jordan Peterson watched because he tweeted it out on Twitter. But the question was, well, this tension. And I think Jordan Peterson intentionally holds the tension about his relationship with Christianity. The reason being that holds the audience. And if he were to ever say, all right, I'm going to join the Roman Catholic Church, then the Orthodox and the Protestants and the atheists would be upset. And any group he would join would alienate the other group, so he's going to hold that tension just like a situation comedy for as long as he can because that keeps the interest on him. A book I've been reading for the past few days is Frank Schaeffer's Crazy for God, which came out a number of years ago, and I'm really enjoying the book. It's, of course, Frank Schaeffer's take on his father Francis Schaeffer's work and ministry. Um, he was then known as Little Frankie growing up at Labrie when people all over Europe were making their way to Labrie to meet with Francis Schaeffer and listen to Francis Schaeffer talk about God and art and philosophy. It's been remarkable how many people have talked to me about Jordan Peterson and Francis Schaeffer. And for a long time I was sort of puzzled about that. Along my journey, I've also bumped into quite a few men older than myself who had actually made their way to Labrie. Um, Warren Mills, who hosted me in Australia, had done some time at Labrie. Bern Power, who I've had some conversations with on my channel, had done some time at Labrie. There have been a number of other individuals who spent time at Labrie and have also kind of been sucked up into the Jordan Peterson movement. And now as I'm reading Frank Schaefer's book, in many ways I can see why. A lot of the dynamics around Peterson are similar. He has been able to work this nexus between Christianity and a number of other broader topics in the culture and bring some attention to it, and that draws people. And, and in fact, some of the times when I hear Frank Schaefer just talking about the kinds of things that Francis Schaeffer would say, saying things like, our society was built on Christian values. If we lose these Christian values, we're going to lose the kind of stability and prosperity we enjoy as a society. Jordan Peterson, Francis Schaeffer, both said very similar things, just now some 35, 40 years apart. Last time I was here, I asked the question, which C.S. Lewis book would you consider perhaps might be a self-help book? And as I thought about 12 Rules for Life, and I thought, which of C.S. Lewis books would be most like 12 Rules for Life, I thought of the screw tape letters. And it seems like a strange choice because Jordan Peterson is rather an open agnostic when it comes to metaphysics, when it comes to the reality of angels or demons, and even God, which we'll talk about a little bit, C.S. Lewis wrote a book about a senior devil writing to a junior devil on how to trap a man's soul. It would seem that the two books were very different, but actually both books are about wisdom. And we talked about that quite a bit at the June 5 meeting. Tonight, I want to focus a little bit more on myth, because one of the interesting contrasts between Lewis and Peterson is very much about myth. Now, both men love to use myths, and in the earlier slide, which is the one I used from this Alistair Roberts, from this Alistair Roberts piece, I wonder if this would work, hey, look at that. Alistair Roberts used this quote from C.S. Lewis from The Myth Becoming Real, which is what I read at the last meeting. A man who disbelieves the Christian story as fact, but continually fed on it as myth, would perhaps be more spiritually alive than one who ascended, assented, but did not think much about it. 
And Alistair Roberts, who is a very sharp English scholar, has very much picked up on this when it comes to Peterson. Now, if we take a look at how Peterson uses myth and how Lewis uses myth, I think there's a, very, there's a deep contrast. If you read 12 Rules for Life, the book is about virtue, the book is about wisdom, and if you watch how Peterson interprets the Bible, he's, he's pretty free in terms of, well, we're not going to worry too much about its relationship to history, let's say, but what the Bible is, is a deep well of wisdom, which is communicated through myth. And so it is very much myth in its connection to wisdom. Lewis, on the other hand, deeply implied in screw tape, is that myth is a window into ultimate reality. And so in a sense, myth for Lewis gives you the big narrative. Myth for wisdom, for, for Peterson, gives you, and very much in a self-help book, how to manage your life. <laughs> Things that you can do to bring success into your life. Screw tape, of course, struck a nerve in World War II England. People imagined, wasn't this demon stuff mere myth? And Lewis sort of flipped it on its back and said, ah, but think about these questions. Look at it from this way of looking at it that you might not think has any value. Yet England, of course, during the war was in an existential crisis that forced it to think about good and evil. And Lewis sort of takes screw tape and says, dare you think about it through this lens. Now, myth has been a big part of Jordan Peterson's rise. Myths are for Peterson, as is the Bible really, the dream sourced and Darwinian tested represented actions that lead to success. And, and so now this plays in different ways with different communities. When you listen to how Jordan Peterson uses the Bible, and there are a lot of biblical citations in 12 Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson mostly uses the Bible as a conveyor of wisdom. Now, if you look at, let's say, segments of the church, evangelicals, conservatives, who often make demands about the relationship between biblical material and history, if you actually listen to how many conservative Christians use the Bible, they also use the Bible as a source of wisdom, a source of examples just like Jordan Peterson does. So Jordan Peterson will say, stay fairly agnostic with respect to questions about the Bible and history, but he'll very much use mythology for wisdom. And myths, like the Bible, are, proved, are proven true by virtue of the success of the civilization that they produce. And so many conservative Christians might look at the Bible and say, well, the Bible is the word of God, therefore it's true. Jordan Peterson comes at it and says, well, look at our society. Western society has, in many ways, for centuries, been on the top of the world. We don't see a lot of people sneaking out of America to move to Africa and Asia. People are moving from Africa and Asia and Latin America to get into the established West because you have the rule of law, you have property rights, you have respect of the individual, all of these values are being, have been demonstrated in the world to, in a sense, be on top and the best. What stands beneath all of these values? The Bible. So in other words, the Bible is validated and verified by the success of Western culture. That's his argument. And therefore, the mythology within the Bible, well, that's validated by Again, the success of Western culture. Now, just over dinner, James is part of our meetup, and we noted over dinner that James has sort of been forest gumping his way through all of the most important churches in the last 30 years in North America. He was a, a found, one of the early members of Saddleback Church, while his brother went to Willow Creek Church. These were two of the central seeker churches in America. 
And back in the 90s, when denominations were sending people out to Saddleback and Willow Creek to learn how to grow a church, guess what these churches did? Now, these churches were fundamentally evangelical in terms of their worldview and their approach to the Bible, but if you listen to Rick Warren or Bill Hybels, they almost always preached out of Proverbs or some other wisdom literature. And what they did was say, we are going to convince Americans that we have credibility by giving them biblical wisdom. And once we have credibility with them on the basis of wisdom, then we will move the other religious pieces into their heart. In some ways, Jordan Peterson is doing a very similar thing, which is really quite fascinating. But again, this is a little bit in contrast to Lewis. Lewis used mythology for wisdom, but Lewis also used the mythology for the bigger pieces of the Bible. Peterson is agnostic at that level, but keeps it there at wisdom. And again, and again as I mentioned, Francis Schaeffer and Jordan Peterson sound a lot of like, but their ideas of the source and the validity of the myths couldn't be more different. Now, how many of you have ever read Maps of Meaning? Okay. <laughs> Getting there. How many of you have tried to read Maps of Meaning? <laughs> In many ways, 12 Rules for Life is Maps of Meaning for the rest of us. And he wrapped it in 12 nice rules that he had sort of crowdsourced on Quora to see, well, these are questions that people are interested in, and these are answers that people are interested in. And this is a publisher's delight, because Peterson already crowd-tested kind of the, the storefront materials in his book. But if you dig into those chapters, what you'll discover is that a lot of the key ideas from Maps of Meaning he is trying to popularize underneath the, the candy shell, as it were, of these 12 Rules for Life. Maps of Meaning is the foundational document with the science, but this book is for public cons popular consumption, dressed up like a self-help book, complete with catchy chapter titles and images that sort of relate to some of the stuff that he wants to convey. And as I mentioned last time, here are the 12 rules. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Treat yourself as someone who, who, you take, who you're supposed to take care of. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Compare yourself to those, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to someone else today. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Be precise in your speech. Don't bother children when they are skateboarding. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Twelve nice, simple, cool rules. But again, if you dig down into those chapters, you'll tend to find quite a bit of stuff that doesn't always really necessarily connect up with the rule of that chapter. The book, in many ways, really starts out where Peterson starts out as a pragmatist. And, and in many ways, the first chapter is a pragmatist guide to a good life, or at least learning to avoid a bad one. And this is where Peterson gets into the animal that he's most famously connected with, which is the lobster. Peterson makes the point, now I actually have a niece who is working on her PhD on lobsters. So I've asked her some of these questions, but she's much more interested in how lobsters are going to fare as the, as the ocean around Boston heats up and the lobsters are moving north. That's the area she's working in, and she doesn't seem to know much about uh, lobster psychology. <laughs> but the point that Peterson is making is that very deep in our systems, we, in our, in our biological um, heredity, we share systems with many animals that deal with our motivation. And these, these motivations have everything to do with 
status. Now, if, you're, you, if you are an observer of people, you will notice this. Because people are highly attuned to that which improves their status within their peers and that which detracts from their status in their peers. Now, actually, as a pastor, you become very keenly aware of this. In certain Asian cultures, you have this saying called losing face, and that's losing status among your peers. When you gather people in a, in a setting such as a small church, you very quickly realize people will not do things that make them lose status. We are all highly aware of this. If you walk into a room and find yourself either overdressed or underdressed, you're not going to make that mistake again. If you walk into a room and you realize, well, if you're a man, you walk into a room and you realize there's someone there that's more successful than you, has a better degree than you, makes more money than you, drives a better car than you, well, you take that into account and you track that. You don't even necessarily pay attention, but you're watching. If you're a woman and you walk into the room, you're paying attention to other things. How are the other women of the room dressed? Am I prettier than they are? What are their husbands like? Where are we on the hierarchy? Peterson makes the point that this is something that we are always processing, and it is a very big deal. And just like with lobsters, if two lobsters square off and one lobster loses, physiologically, these two lobsters change. Now, we as human beings, our physiological transformations are a little bit more subtle, a little bit less dramatic, but it happens to us too. That's why his rule is stand up with your shoulders straight. Present yourself as a top lobster. But we are always paying attention to status. Don't be fooled. We really are. You're designed to compete in hierarchies. And this is tied to your emotional system that you live on. Now, one of the beautiful things about human beings is that one of the things we do is we multiply human hierarchies. So maybe I walk into the room and, well, I'm very tall. And so I look around and say, who's about as tall as I am? And, well, Andrew's pretty tall. And so I look at him and, well, I'm a little younger. He's a little older. Oh, James is pretty tall. And he's, he's got that big beard going on. So, you know, we're just all thinking like this, even if we're not doing it consciously. But I might say, oh, but I have a better job than James. But James has a PhD. But what we do then is we multiply the hierarchies. So if we walk into this room, we sort of size each other up, but we can find some little niche that, well, I can dominate my little niche. Maybe I'm the best tennis player in the room. I might not, I might not even know if I'm the best tennis player in the room, but if I think I'm the best tennis player in the room, then I have status. And so what we do is we multiply these little hierarchies. Get ahead at work, be successful at home, win at a sport, be more attractive, be smarter, be wealthier, be the best chess player, be the be have the best stamp collection, have the nicest car among your peers. Well, maybe your car gets the best gas mileage. Um, have the fastest lab rat. Uh, have the best trained dog. It doesn't matter. Just have something that, in this space, I'm on top with. And that's a big deal. Because if you can't find anything, well, then you're going to be in trouble. Now, it's also true that it's not just all these petty little things that we're paying attention to. Age, looks, reputation, income, uh, status at work. Uh, marital status, all of these kinds of things, we are actually immersed in a very rich story verse. What I mean by that is, well, you might not be the best looking person in the room, but your spouse loves you and everything's okay. You might not be the wealthiest person in the room, but in your little corner of academia, you're a big dog and everything's okay. 
Well, what happens when we get into the religious dimension of this? Just today, you know, I, I put out these horrendously long videos. One of the long videos I put out today dealt a little bit with well, Protestant Calvinism and resurgence Calvinism through the likes of John Piper and Tim Keller. And Tim Keller loves to say, you're a worse sinner than you can possibly imagine. Ooh. <laughs> but you are more loved than you can possibly imagine. Oh, God loves me. God approves of me. Well, if God approves of me, well, then I can walk into a room and maybe I'm going bald. Maybe I'm not the wealthiest person here. Maybe James has a PhD and I don't. Maybe all of these things, but God loves me. So I can stand up straight with my shoulders back. Jordan Peterson doesn't go here of course, because on the big, big picture mythology stuff, he's going to stay mute and agnostic. But the story verse is fundamental for us as human beings. Competition over material objects is a tiny portion of what we care about. Our identities are all avatars in an endless economy of competition, and they play out with others on an eternal stage. If you're a Hindu, you might be banking credits in the karma bank so that you can be released from this endless cycle of reincarnation. If you're a Christian, maybe you're storing up your treasures in heaven. There's all these games that we play. And in fact, human beings have been working this stuff for as long as we've had human civilization. One of the big influences of Jordan Peterson is, of course, Carl Jung. And, and Carl Jung understood that ancient man, in fact, wrote his stories in the sky. And whereas we have these things, books, and now the internet and, and computers, in the ancient world, you would look up in the sky and all of these constellations would be connected to all of these stories and you understood your place in the world. And the heavens, well, in the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God. All of this stuff was the world around us, and we lived within this rich story verse, full of characters, full of drama, but we had our place in it. Now, if you take that vision and you connect it to Jordan Peterson's lobsters with their hierarchies and their serotonin, you have a sense of how in the ancient world and through most of human history, without medical technology, without anesthesia, and all the powerful drugs that we have today, people survived. They didn't just survive, they thrived. They lived in a rich world, a rich story verse, full of stories and symbols, and this is what helped human beings struggle through all of the pain of life. The church, of course, came to dominate and in many places, especially in the West, overcome the pagan world, but then you lived with a rich Christian mythology and you had the story of Jesus and the stories from the Old Testament and you had the heavens above and the earth below. And the heavens did declare the wonders of God, and the whole earth was full of his glory. And when the church would roll into a new place like, like northern Europe, you would assimilate some of their mythology and put it into your Christian mythology. And every winter we all put up a Christmas tree. And then the church would roll into the lives of of North Africans or, or West Africans who were taken from West Africa and brought to places like Hispaniola. Well, the Catholicism and the gods of the land they came from would all mix together. And so for the Haitians that I worked with in the Dominican Republic, the ones who weren't yet Christians, to be a good practitioner of voodoo also meant to be a good Roman Catholic. And the Dominicans had Santeria, and you had all of this rich world in which we lived. But in Europe, bit by bit by bit, 
You had the Protestant Reformation in which, well, we got rid of all the statues, didn't we? And, and we, we tended to keep our ideation and our thoughts, well, pretty Spartan in our spare churches. And then you had providential deism develop, and bit by bit by bit, God got further and further and further away. After Darwin, we no longer felt we needed God to provide the material realm. We had all of these stories by which, well, we could be generated from animals, and, and single-cell organisms became multi-cell organisms, and on and on and on and on. And here we are, and the, we have these big brains to make up all these stories, but none of these stories are true. God had been floating away, beginning at least with the Protestant Reformation, maybe as early as the 12th century, but continued to provide providential deism and a clockmaker universe. And then you can begin to understand why in the 17th and 18th century, philosophy and theology became anxious about this God that was retreating. And we had to try and sort of explain this God in terms of a feeling of ultimate dependence or, or all of these other ways of saying, well, we don't, we don't really believe in, in the God as we used to know him. It's, it's more these other mechanisms, these psychological mechanisms that, that we have to kind of keep him around. The West had so much sunk cost in Christianity, we kept trying to figure out how he, would, how he would work without believing in the old stories. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a bit of a video. But one of the things that I figured out after watching Jordan Peterson spar with the likes of Sam Harris was that in many ways, God got split up in the divorce of heaven and earth in the history of the West. And I call these two aspects God number one and God number two. God number one is built into the world. He is the one who selects. And that got replaced by natural selection. And what we mean by natural is not something guided by intentionality or mind. God number one, the one who brings disasters upon the ungodly, like you might read in the Bible. Now we call these natural disasters. And every time there's a tsunami or a volcano, Christians rush in and say, well, God didn't mean to hurt anybody, or some other story. God number one, the God whose glory can be seen. Now it's nature's glory, just a product of random chance or natural process. God number one is impersonal. God number two is the God that Sam Harris debunks. God number two is a God who has thoughts about your sex life and thoughts about how you spend your money. God number two acts in history. God number two is the one who answers prayers. As God number one receded and receded and receded, God number two expanded in order to compensate. And you can see quite a bit of this in the middle of the 20th century when the likes of Charles Colson begins a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and goes to his wife and says, Honey, I've become a Christian. And his wife looks at him and says, Honey, We've been going to church all of our life. Oh, but I'm a real Christian now. What's taken place in the culture? Jesus is now my friend. Churchgoers now become newly alive. They have a personal relationship with God, whereas before God was more abstract and more like a government. You have the roots of what sociologist Christian Smith would call moralistic therapeutic deism. When he surveyed North Americans, North American youth, these are the ones who didn't have all the complexities of adults, and he would sit them down and they would ask them questions about morality and religion and the universe. You had Baptists, 
and Reformed and Presbyterians and Mormons and Muslims and Jews and atheists. And what Christian Smith discovered was that they all believed in the same thing. That, well, good people go to heaven when they die. A few bad people like Stalin and Hitler, they might go to hell, but it's your job to be good, and God is somehow out there, and if you need him, it's his job to help you feel better about yourself and maybe help you find a parking spot or fix a really bad thing in your life. And everybody sort of believed in that God, very much God number two. And then Jordan Peterson comes along, and the reason I got into Jordan Peterson was I began listening to how he talked about the Bible, and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. And I saw him making stands on things that I wouldn't expect a psychologist from the University of Toronto to take stands on. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And then I noticed he's talking about the Bible and filling up a concert hall in Toronto. And I thought, well, maybe he's some evangelical who, you know, has a little church group. Uh, no, nope, he's filling this place with 600 people, charging 40 bucks a head. And then I listened to him, and I thought, well, he's no evangelical. What is he doing? Why are people listening? And then I began to discover reading comment threads that people were saying things like, well, when Jordan Peterson talks about the Bible, well, I think it has some credibility. And he's opened the Bible to me. And I'm kind of interested in Christianity. And I'm kind of interested in the Bible. And I'm kind of interested in God. And I thought, I've been watching churches beat on this door for a long, long time, getting nothing. And here this guy says these things, and everyone's now sort of interested in what's going on. So Jordan Peterson had four talks with Sam Harris. Sam Harris, a celebrity atheist, and Brett Weinstein, who is an evolutionary biologist, was the moderator. And in their first talk in Vancouver, they got to a point and the night was almost wrapping up and they never really got to the one question that everyone really wanted to know about. What does Jordan Peterson think about God? because the atheists had been listening to him, and a lot of atheists weren't quite so sure about their atheism anymore, so they wanted to know, Jordan, what do you think about God? So what I'm going to play for you is actually the clip where I started to get this idea about God number one and God number two. Now listen very carefully to how Jordan Peterson talks about what he understands God to be. And listen carefully to what Sam Harris assumes, and then towards the end of the talk, they're going to talk about prayer. So here's my question for you, is um, if we agree that there is some way in which religious texts carry some kind of value because they allow people to figure out how to navigate their lives in ways that might reduce suffering, reduce the complexity of the choices that they have to make. Presumably, you will agree that that would be consistent with an evolutionary interpretation, that the fact that the stories themselves uh, are um, yes. functional would provide an advantage to those who were deploying them. Yes. So here's the problem. Isn't it then also true that those stories are responsive to past environments? And so the claim that these things might be timeless would be suspect. And yes. in fact, you would expect a spectrum of uh, durability. Some stories would be right in a brief moment. And, yes. Okay. All that's true. All that's true. So far, so good. Well, so far, so good. This is, this is actually, I think, quite... Excellent, then, because what we have is a recognition that there is something to these belief systems that has to do with practical realities in the past, and we also have an acknowledgement that we cannot trust in these things based on simple faith, because even if they are, can be certain to have worked at some point in the past, we don't know what their relevance is to the present. Right. Okay. Fair enough. All right. I <laughs> okay. So... 
Okay, so, so I... That's, and I would say that's, that's two things about that. Um, that's exactly why we're having this discussion. And you see what happens in the most profound of such texts is the idea that the process by which your knowledge is updated has to occupy a position in the hierarchy of values that supersedes your reliance on dogma is the fundamental claim. That's why, for example, in Christianity, the notion is, is that the word is the highest of values. And that's the embodied word. And that's the thing that mediates between order and chaos. And everything else has to be subject to that. And I would say that's not a claim that's unique to Christianity. So, for example... Okay, no, I think, I, think we, I think because we're, we're, being, to, we're being told we're out of time yeah. here, so I want to give Sam his reaction to that as well, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Well, I'm tempted to just ask Jordan a question here. I mean, I, this, it's hard to know what to say for tomorrow night, but I, I feel yeah. like we've got 3,000 people sitting here who would really like an answer to this question. Uh, You say you believe in God. You have been... No, I say I act as if he exists. You say what? I say I act as if he exists, okay. which so, is a much more precise claim. Okay, so, so then what, what... But in this case, what... So you act as though God exists. Yep. And in addition, I've heard you say that I act as though God exists, that I'm, I can't really well, be so an atheist. Far, so far, it seems yeah, that. Right, yeah. <laughs> We'll the, see. The, the night is young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, in that sense, I'm not really an atheist. I've, I've heard you say this. So that it, it, well, to, some of you is. Well, in, if I were really an atheist, I would be far more poorly behaved than, in fact, I am. Right? I would be like Raskolnikov committing murders and, and assuming there was nothing it wrong with more, it. Yeah. It would be more likely, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so Wait, that's a big distinction. I need, would yeah, I need to know. Be more likely. What was that? It's a big distinction. That you would is very different than it would be more likely. Taking the safety off the gun is not the same thing as shooting it. Right? Yeah. So the temptations laid open to Raskolnikov would be more at hand. Okay. Just as they were to him. So, what in, that, so in, in what sense do you mean... What, what is the God that you act as though he, she, it exists... And what is the what what is the God-shaped thing I must have in my life to prevent me from being a quote real atheist? Well, okay. First of all, I have to point out that there's no possible way I can answer both those questions in two minutes. Well, it's the, it's, it's the same question. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, what is okay. it, like what what do you mean by God? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you some of the things that I mean by God. Okay. Uh oh. Uh, we we do have to get to questions. Maybe we're going to do this tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe this is where right. we we start. Oh God. Well, that was a pretty resounding well, maybe that's no. A, it so. seems like that constitutes an audience question, wouldn't you say? All right, I tell you what, I tell you what. Let's, yeah. um... Let's do this, but let's be deliberate about time. Okay, okay. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read some things that I wrote because it's so complicated that I'm not sure that I can just spin it off the top of my head, and so you'll have to excuse me. So, and what I'm going to do is sort of paint a picture by, by, by highlighting different things. So now, I already made one point here. I, m I made the point that part of the conception of God that underlies the Western ethos is the notion that whatever God is, is expressed in tr the truthful speech that rectifies pathological hierarchies. And that isn't all it does. It also confronts the chaos of being itself and generates habitable order. That's, a, that's the metaphysical proposition. And that that's best conceptualized as at least one element of God. And so I would think about it as a transcendent reality that's only observable across the longest of time frames, the longest of iterated time frames, to your point. So, so okay, so here's, here's some propositions. And they're complicated, and they need to be unpacked. So I'm just going to read them, and you're, that'll have to do for the time being. So, God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. 
as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. So what that means in some sense is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure that are a consequence of processes of evolution that, that occurred over unbelievably vast expanses of time and that structure your perception of reality in ways that it wouldn't be structured if you only lived for the amount of time that you're going to live. And that's also part of the problem of deriving values from facts because you're evanescent and, and you can't derive the right values from the facts that port portray themselves to you in your lifespan, which is why you have a biological structure that's like 3.5 billion years old. So God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. That's a fundamental element of hero mythology. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. That's another way of looking at it. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal call to adventure. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is the future to which we make sacrifices and something akin to the transcendental repository of reputation. Here's a cool one if you're an evolutionary biologist. God, God, God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. So, you know, men arrange themselves into hierarchies and then men rise in the hierarchy. And there's principles that are important that determine the probability of their rise. And those principles aren't tyrannical power. They're something like the ability to articulate truth and the ability to be competent and the ability to make appropriate moral judgments. And if you can do that in a given situation, then all the other men will vote you up the hierarchy, so to speak, and that will radically increase your reproductive fitness. And the operation of that process across long expanses of time looks to me like it's codified in something like the notion of God the Father. It's also the same thing that makes women, men attractive to women, because men, women peel off the top of the male hierarchy. And the question is, what should be at the top of the hierarchy? And, the answer right now is tyranny as part of the patriarchy, but the real answer is something more like the ability to use truthful speech in the service of, let's say, well-being. And so that's, that's something that operates across tremendous expanses of time, and it plays a role in the selection for survival itself, which makes it a fundamental reality. Jordan, if so, I... Um, so, let me say, Sam, um, I do not believe in a supernatural God. But the God that I heard Jordan just describe, I do not have any difficulty understanding why he might care if you masturbate, and I also don't have any trouble figuring out how he might answer yeah. prayers. Well, well, tell me more then. Well, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, I can tell you how a prayer might be answered. Okay, but the, these are well, so, it's specific, well, so, so you could let me do that. So you, it'll be interesting. So. I'm not Jordan, we've not talked about this. If I heard an answer from him that actually would satisfy me as to what the mechanism of action might be, that, that, that'd be pretty interesting. And if he can tell me what I heard, uh, I, I think it would, it would suggest that, that we're not just making up stories here. Okay, so, so, so and I, you might like this, you maybe don't, but, well, it, it's possible. Okay, so imagine that, okay, so let's imagine that hellish situation that you laid out. Okay, uh, but, but let's, let's put the extra twist in it because one of the things that we both decided, I think, was that you also have to build in the intent into that. So let's say the hell that we're talking about isn't the victim of the terrible massacres that you, you, you laid out in the jungle story, but a perpetrator. Okay, so someone who's actually acted in a malevolent manner, truly malevolent manner. Okay, or, or maybe perhaps we wouldn't have to take that extreme a case. We could say, well, perhaps you've decided that any of you, you've decided that you've seriously done something wrong, okay, and that you, you want to get away from hell, you want to make things better. Okay, so here's, here's an exercise you can try. So here, what you do is, is, is you sit on the edge of your bed and you say, okay, what I did was wrong. And, and you have to really believe this, right? So you've thought about it, it's killing you. It's killing you. So now you're penitent and you're confessing, let's say and you're confessing to yourself as much as to anyone, and you say, I really want to know what I did wrong, and I really want to know what I could do to put it right, and I'm willing to accept any answer that will manifest itself to me. You try that. 
See what happens. Well, I, you, that's a prayer that will be answered, and it won't be answered in the way that you want it to be answered. I can bloody well tell you that. Okay, but but that. Well, what are you communicating that, with? That, when you, that what is, are you communicating with when no, you do no, that? No, no, that that is something that that is a process that I'm familiar with. It doesn't require any supernatural explanation, and it certainly it certainly doesn't require that we imagine that any of our books were dictated by the creator of the universe. I didn't say that it so, required any supernatural oh, oh, no, okay, no, but, well, or that it required the book. Concerns. I was asked to provide an instance of prayer that worked, and that's what I did. I didn't okay, do anything that, other than that. That's, un, that's fully understandable in terms of human psychology. And it's not understandable because we don't know where the answer comes from. Well, we don't know where anything comes from. That's true. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, mm -hmm. but... That doesn't, that doesn't open the door. I mean, we, when, one thing we can know with absolute certainty is that, that whoever wrote the Bible didn't know either. And there's many other things he or she didn't know, like everything else we know scientifically, right? It's, so, not, it's not so obvious what no, people know no and, one and even, what they don't No know. one even knew the brain was involved in any of this, right? So, yeah, but they so, probably so, knew about okay. as much as we do about how the brain was involved in it. So what did you notice? <laughs> What did you notice? A lot of slipperiness. A lot of slipperiness. How? Rephrasing. Listen, if you can remember, what kinds of things did Jordan Peterson describe as God? Consciousness. Consciousness. <laughs> No. <laughs> he described a source that we don't understand as a source of answers. That was the one, the thing that responded to prayer. And he seems to describe what we would attribute as God. It's, and, and he also seemed to take the materialist world only view of Sam Harris and be very specific on Harris's comments and show where Harris's <coughs> position is inadequate and then leaves it. How about earlier in the clip when he sits down with his computer and he starts reading stuff? Do you remember any of, do you remember what you heard when he was reading some of those things? What kinds of things were they? But before he even started that, he, he said it and then he repeated himself and that is a concept. Okay, okay. A long time. Emergent time. Something that, something that sorts out. Something that's built in. In fact, if you listen to really all of these conversations with Sam Harris, what they amount to is he keeps trying to help Sam Harris understand that when we are born into this world and as we are raised and enculturated and on all of this stuff we do, we implement and utilize systems that we have inherited biologically and socially and those systems are fundamental in order to make life work. Without those systems, human beings would not be human beings. Those essentially are God number one. And so what Jordan Peterson really does is said, okay, after Darwin, everybody said, well, maybe you didn't need God number one in order to have the world. Jordan Peterson essentially says, and I think this is mostly beneath the surface, people pick it up, but they might not be conscious of it. Maybe you don't need God to explain why we have human beings in terms of our physical bodies with eyes and hands and hair and feet and all of that. But you do need God number one. You do need these structures to understand human beings psychologically. You're not going to get human beings without these things. Yes? Psychologically, and I keep thinking ethically as well. I think a lot of yes. what he said had to do with sort of ethical behavior. Yes. And I'm trying to remember, there are others in the room who read much more of C.S. Lewis than I, but there's one of his books where he starts out with this, this sense of right and wrong that we have built into us. And that, that's what I was hearing him do. Right, right. So the question he kept ducking from Harris was supernatural. Yes. He kept ducking every time Harris said uh, supernatural, Jordan 
Right. Because Jordan will say, I'm going to stay agnostic about what we would call supernatural. And notice the conversation about prayer then. And, and where this really goes to, I would say, is God and the Turing test. Do any of you, how many of you know what the Turing test is? Okay. It's from Alan Turing. And, and it's, a, it's a very famous test. And the test is basically this. Put a person on the phone and can you fool a human being into thinking they are conversing with another human being when they're really talking to a computer? And that's something that developers of AI are really working towards. Because obviously, once you have a computer that can fool us into thinking there's another person on the other end of the line, well, now you don't need to hire expensive things like human beings that have to eat and have families and health insurance. Now you can just have a mainframe do all the talking for you. And every now and then, and I'm sure many of us are having this experience, sometimes you pick up the phone and you're talking to someone and there's these little paws and little hesitations and you just kind of wonder, am I talking to a real person? Or am I talking to a computer? So then you may be asking oddball, unexpected question to try and trip it up. And, you know, this is kind of spy versus spy we're playing. But, but this is the question, that, the, the question of the supernatural that Jordan Peterson is, is in a sense avoiding because what he's saying, asking the question is, wh at what point is the universe already so complex that it's indistinguishable from us, for us, from personhood. And so that's part of the reason he's always vague in terms of the ontology of what I would call a God number two, a God that is conscious, a God that is the source of all consciousness. Now he's agnostic on those fronts and he's open on those fronts. He will say, I'm not ready to say there isn't because the world is a very strange place, but I'm also not ready to say there is. Because, then we're back to the Jim and Pam thing, now he's sort of in a corner. So when he has a conversation with Sam Harris, Sam Harris gets very, very frustrated because Jordan Peterson just stays right on this line and Sam Harris really wants to attack him in the way, as Jordan Peterson characterizes it, the way perhaps a smart 13-year-old would attack him. <laughs> yes. So as the book continues, basically what you have is... Jordan Peterson working these matrices. And he uses sections from the Bible in the book, and the sections from the Bible are wisdom. And so the Bible is, in a sense, the crowdsourced dreams hewed by a story verse Darwinian process that distills for us wisdom. It's very Jungian. <laughs> And then when he gets into sacrifice, sacrifice is, in fact, the invention of the future, where we, where we attempt to withhold gratification, invest in whatever it is that might be God in the story verse out there, and then the groups of people that learn to withhold gratification and sacrifice for the future outcompete groups that don't learn to sacrifice for the future. And the groups that have the best wisdom accumulate it, outcompete the other groups that have lesser wisdom. And here at the end of the story, you get Western civilization, the book that built Western civilization, and in a sort of in a sort of Francis Schaeffer way comes about and says, here we are. Here's our book. I'm going to be agnostic with respect to the God stuff. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm not going to say. I'm willing to relate fine with both groups. But if we lose this wisdom and we lose the practice of it, we're going to lose the kinds of things that have given us the prosperity and the security and the happiness that we all enjoy at a greater level than the rest of the world. And that's, in a sense, his argument. You got a question? Uh, so Sam Harris says you can kill a one-year-old, it doesn't matter. Is Jordan Peterson, for, for, 
but is confusing. Part of how Jordan Peterson really rattles Sam Harris is he is undermining the, the, the warrant for that position. Sam Harris and a number of others have basically been promoting the idea that if you get rid of all of this religious stuff, people will suddenly become rational. And, and what he means by rational is, well, you obviously know what is better than what is worse, and so people will choose what is better, and then the whole world will become rational. Peterson doesn't believe that because he says, with a good bit of evidence, actually, if you take, pe take away people's formal religious ideas in time, what they tend to, what they tend to substitute it with are usually little low-level superstitions that eventually begin the process of once again rebuilding another religion. In other words, we're incurably religious. If you take away people's religion, they'll either become self-destructive or communally destructive or just start the process over again and once again rebuild another religion because we can't live without it. And that obviously is against Sam Harris's worldview, which says we'd all be better if we lived without it. When you compare this with Lewis, you can really see how in many ways Peterson is like a pagan. Now, C.S. Lewis had an interesting conversation with a Roman Catholic, I don't know if he was, a, he was, it was basically running a house for orphans. Um, I forget his name, maybe some of you will remember. Yes, Giovanni Calabria. And if you, if you Google Giovanni Calabria, you'll notice that he, in fact, became a Roman Catholic saint. This is a letter that Lewis wrote to Calabria on 15 September 1953. Regarding the moral condition of our times, since you bid me prattle on, I think this. Older people, as we both are, are always praisers of times past. They always think the world is worse than it was in their younger days. Therefore, we ought to take care lest we go wrong. But with this proviso, certainly I feel that the very grave dangers hang over us. This result from the apostasy of the great part of Europe from the Christian faith. Hence, a worse state than the one before we were in um, than the one we were in before we received the faith. For no one returns from Christianity to the same slate he was in before Christianity in a worse state. The difference between a pagan and an apostate is the difference between an unmarried woman and an adulteress. A faith perfects nature, but faith, corrupt, but faith lost corrupts nature. Therefore, many men in our time have lost not only the supernatural light, but also the natural light which pagans possessed. But God, who is the God of mercies, even now has not altogether cast off the human race. In younger people, although we may see much cruelty and lust, yet at the same time we do not we do not see very many sparks of virtue which perhaps our own generation lacked. Do we not see sparks of virtue which perhaps our own generation lacked? How much courage, how much concern for the poor do we see? We must not despair. And among us, a not inconsiderable number are now returning to the faith. This is Lewis in 53. So much for the present condition. About remedies, the question is much is more difficult. For my part, I believe we ought, not, we ought to work not only at spreading the gospel, that's certainly, but also at certain preparation for the gospel. It is necessary to recall many of the law of nature before we talk about God. For Christ promises forgiveness of sins, but what is, not, but what is that to those who, since they do not know the law of nature? do not know that they have sinned, who, have, who, will take who will take medicine unless he knows he is in the grip of a disease. Moral re relativity is the enemy which we have to overcome before we tackle atheism. I would almost dare to say 
First, let us make the younger generation good pagans, and afterwards, let us make them Christians. C.S. Lewis, 1953. Any questions? Lewis clearly has uh, the story to, to, to the end. Peterson seems to lack it. And I think that's what the is he, isn't he might be so potent with, right? Is that clearly at the end here, Lewis is saying the, the goal would be Christianity. Where, whereas 12 Rules for Life doesn't necessarily give a goal, or is there a hint of Peterson's work that gives that goal for the end after the, they've become good pagans? The goal in 12 Rules for Life is wisdom and virtue, mm -hmm. that you will enjoy a better life, and if individuals all are better people, society will be a better society, and especially in one particular chapter, if you tell the truth or at least don't lie, mm -hmm. that's a hedge against tyranny. But, and that's why Peterson uses mythology for wisdom, but Lewis also uses mythology for the grand narrative, and that's why Lewis sees this picture and Peterson doesn't. Can you point to any evidence that Peterson is not living out the last paragraph where Lewis says, recall me to the law of nature before we talk about God? Can you point to any evidence that Lewis, that Jordan Peterson isn't doing that as M. Scott Peck, who in his fourth oh, yes. book writes People to Lie, the first one, Road Less Travel, and then two sequels, well, I'm dabbling with Buddhism, and now he's saying, dude, I'm a total Christian. Right. Is, do you see any evidence Peterson not doing exactly that and staying there first for quite a while? I don't think Peterson has a master plan. I don't see Peterson as a committed Christian who is running the long con on a few million people in the West. Con or preparation? I, I think Peterson is being completely honest about his convictions and what he believes. And I take Peterson at his word when, even if it's a little confusing at times, um, I take him at his word. I think he's exactly who he is. And I think Noble Pagan isn't a bad characterization. Yes? I think it's important to have people like that that can meet others at their growing edge. Because um, if, he, if he weren't exactly who he is right now, he wouldn't have sold three million copies of his book, you know. I mean, there are a lot of other writers that may have a more vocal or committed Christian voice that don't have influence in the culture. Um, and whatever role he is playing, whether you view it as a bridge or as an end, um, sort of going alongside people at their growing edge, like, like he was with Sam Harris, um, you can't have a conversation otherwise. Um, and I think that he's the conversation partner that a lot of people need that, in the culture at this time. Yes? Well, I think Peterson has a couple of really wonderful qualities. One is there's a great earnestness about him. Mm -hmm. And he's very discerning. And he's hopeful. And those are significant qualities. And, and, and what he doesn't, so what he does is he lives his life and he sees things and he says, these are, these are signs about how we can live better lives. I know we're supposed to live better lives because we can't not have the structure of a, of a God giving us directions and, and so on so that we live a life that's meaningful and valuable. He just doesn't know where to go with where this began. And so he also doesn't know where it ends up. But he sees it, and 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 yet the wonderful thing is the marked contrast between him and Harris is Harris really wants them the the possibility of God excluded, and he's committed to that despite the fact that he really should be chilling because Jordan Peterson's calling him on it and saying you got to step back, you're making statements and you don't know that that's true, right? Yeah, Peterson Peterson would say this whole matrix of this crowdsourced, dream-sourced Bible 
honed by Darwin, given to us, now proven by our success in the world, is good enough. It's good enough for us to build a meaningful life on, to sustain a civilization on. Doesn't need to know the beginning, doesn't need to know the end, agnostic on those counts. That's right, so he's a pragmatist. Mm. Sometimes it's infuriating that I'm reading it. It's, it's, it's this kind of funny way he has with, with authority there. He, he creates these myths. He creates these stories. He, he gets very dogmatic about that. And, but his authority sources usually either they work or we have an evolutionary history or some of these other things. And sometimes it's like, how, how can we argue with it there? Because it's, you know, it's sort of like. He's almost something axiomatically there. So it's really, so it's sort of like either you buy it or you don't buy it there. But it's, and for people who are looking, looking for something that for, you know, certainly it's, it's something to do there. And it's nothing challenging because there's no person out there that you're responsible for. You're only responsible for yourself there. And it's also appealing to you and your heart to you know what's, what's good for you or what's right for you. It's a constant appealing. Yeah, do the right thing, but he never defines what the right thing is. He just kind of, he kind of opinion the fact that if you're honest with something, that you, you know, this, you'll somehow figure out what, what's the right thing or the good thing to do, and you'll, and you'll be constructive rather than destructive. But and there's no evidence, that he doesn't have any evidence to show that that's the case. It's kind of an art act of faith. Well, I, I would argue that he has a framework that he would st say comes from the Bible, that that has been proven by the culture, and so that will be your frame of reference. I think that's how he would argue. Mark. I've been struck as I'm trying to finally make my way through all 12 rules. So even in his answer to Harris there or to Weinstein's question, so they, they, they're starting to talk about crime and punishment's character. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if the proof almost clinically of someone's um, you know, ethical approach, their axioms, and what that would play out as, you know, Harris is trying to defend his own of not, you know, um, being as bad as possible. And uh, it seems to me that the stories that Peterson also brings are his own experiences from his clinical work, right? That, and in a lot of ways, those are as axiomatic as, as the collective unconscious in some ways, because, uh, yeah, he, he pragmatically says, you can argue with me all day long about this in concept. I have these real life experiences with people, right? So this chapter, Rule 10, is about you know, married couples. And he's like, you've got to be precise because if you're going to diagnose the, 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 the real evils of everyday living, you have to tell the truth. It reminds me of uh, debates that in the early church, St. Augustine, like he, he was radical on lying. Lying in early Christianity was a huge deal, and there were huge tomes written on this. And it's fascinating to see some of that almost like play out again mm -hmm. in this diagnosis of almost Western culture. Mm -hmm. um, Peterson is almost looking at it like a clinician saying, "Well, we can we can fight over evolutionary biology's merits <laughs> to 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 say you know this might be more effective than that." Um, but to me, when he starts talking about the logos, then, I mean, this is, this is really about pre precision in speech. He spoke in San Francisco the other month and was talking about communication's value. And if enough people do enough communicating, who knows what might come, mm -hmm. right? And, and that smacks of almost a theological openness to saying, there's, there's limits we assume are built in on the human capacity for for not only self-development, but the impact that has in in uh, in composite. That if people tell enough of the truth, uh, he he's not just being Pollyannish or overly optimistic. He he genuinely has seen this in people's lives, and and to me that that's valuable not just from this frame of reference of like a godly pagan or not. Like um, finally, I get to a question for you, Paul. Is you know when when you talk about wisdom here. And there's, there's certain limits, you might say, um, but where's, the, where's that point of reference where uh, kind of the Protestant humanists who said, they're not wrong, right? It's, <laughs> it's not that they're wrong. It might be, they might be lacking in its further application. Where, where does wisdom have, 
have its merit. That what does what does Peterson mean by logos, and what's that relationship to, to wisdom? He's there. Are, there are a number of phrases that Peterson uses, which I call his gospel phrases, and I don't mean that in the Christian sense. I mean that in the sense that this is what he says really is key, and and logos. You know, I've used this illustration for my Sunday school class. If well, so the dog peeked his head in the room here for a second, right? And just maybe not ever, none of you saw it. But if let's say the dog had gotten loose and, and run through the room, suddenly in a small way, a little bit of chaos would have invaded this room, and and y'all would have been wondering that did David let a dog in? What what kind of trick is is David playing? What's going on with us? And then if I would have said, oh, that's my dog. I told him to sit in the other room. He must have got out. Logos, word, would have taken chaos and brought order and given meaning to a small event that happened in this room. And, and so that's where the spoken word for Peterson, and he, he connects John 1 and Genesis 1 and, and says, you know, this is, you, you heard him say a little bit of it in this clip, that, that this is why the spoken word is at the top of the hierarchy. Because this is the, the best tool we have to manage the chaos that people are and bring us to order and create habitable order in the midst of this myriad of complexity that each of us has inside of us and which is multiplied by all of us between us. And, and so that's why that's so high on there, and I love the, the, what you pointed out in the chapter. In that particular chapter, you know, he talks about the elephant in the room or the dragon in the household. And it's only by the logos, the word, that that dragon can be slain and order can be restored in the household. And he's a clinical psychologist, so he sits down and what does he have people do in a room? Talk. <laughs> it's the best tool we have. Okay. Yes, in the... I was wondering if there'd been a debate instead of with Sam Harris, if there'd been a debate with, say, C.S. Lewis, if that had been possible, or with Joseph Campbell, what would the points of disagreement have been? So one of the questions I had for my questions was dis for discussion was, what would Lewis think of Peterson? And, and I think on one hand, I think Lewis would appreciate, you know, the mythology. I mean, Lewis also could be pretty, uh, he, could, he, he was a pretty sharp guy. He could have a sharp tongue. It depends, you know, what, what mode Lewis was in. I, I think Lewis, if he were, if Peterson was a visitor to the Socratic society, um, I think Lewis probably would have chopped him up pretty quickly because showing, you know, pointing out, okay, you're using mythology here. But isn't mythology really to fill the skies? Isn't mythology really to give us the great narratives that we live by? And you're kind of distilling it for, for wisdom to help make our little lives work. What about, see, because of course Lewis saw Christianity stepping in as in his chapter, The Great Miracle, as that missing chapter in the book that made the whole book make sense. And of course, Lewis talks about die incarnation as the great miracle and all of that. So Lewis would have really, I think, pushed Peterson on, all right, let's talk mythology, and pushed him further to say, as I think Barfield did to Lewis, that imagination is actually can pay out in bigger terms than your small rationality. So in other words, you've kind of got Sam Harris here. Peterson, I think, pretty much handles Sam Harris pretty well. I think Lewis would have been able to contextualize them both. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Philip. Um, it seems to me that Peterson has an intuitive quality sometimes that Harris completely lacks, although I'm not as familiar with Harris. And part of that I see is Peterson having an intuitive understanding that paradox is profoundly meaningful and is transcendently meaningful in a sense because it's beyond intentionality or authorship in a human plotting kind of way. It's interesting to me that Harris seems almost to be verging on solipsism or headed in that direction. Like if you keep Sam Harris saying Sam Harris, he will end up as pure solipsism because he's kind of expanded. There's a thing that Chesterton talks about about 
trying to get the universe in your head, and it's like your head that splits, you know, <laughs> at the beginning of orthodoxy. Um, it just seems odd to me that Harris, while professing to be kind of the expansive liberator, seems to me to be a very, to have a totally constrictive affect, and Peterson is open and has an expansive affect, almost like yin and yang, and it seems that that's why I think Peterson doesn't commit. I, I, I don't see any point in him committing. It's not his function right now. And what he's doing is so, he's hit oil, you know? I mean, so why, why, why complain that you're not, you know, you, you didn't hit something else? <laughs> like, you know, I found this silver mine, but I was looking for gold, so forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about meaning, and, and there's meaning, but in the, in the Sam Harris world, there can be no meaning, and does not myth expose human beings have to have meaning. Do we see meaning, or is meaning an emotion? That's the difference between Sam Harris and, say, C.S. Lewis especially. C.S. Lewis would say in The Abolition of Man, we see, we've got the capacity to see meaning. So meaning is actually exists and we participate in it. Harris would say meaning is an emotion that we can generate. Okay, James, and then you. Uh, two things kind of thinking about juxtaposing C.S. Lewis and Peterson would be the classic surprised by joy on the one hand, the yoni, and the lingam of surprised by darkness, and Peterson's focus on uh, the Cold War. Uh, and one other thing is that Lewis went to war, and Peterson got depressed over the concept of war. Now, both of them did, but one of them experienced it in, in, the, in the fullness of it, and the other one was taken to a mental health break by it. Um, and so I think that the Lewis might see him as someone who's in that process of being ready to be surprised by joy rather than remaining surprised by human darkness. One of, one of the slides that was I took the ending of Living in an Atomic Age. That's a beautiful piece of Lewis's to read thinking about Peterson. Because, of course, Peterson gets started out of the anxiety of the Cold War Lewis ends living in the atomic age by making the point that all of this mythology is, the, the, I mean, we can live now in the atomic age, in the age of the atom bomb, because of this mythology. And it's more than just a coping mechanism. <laughs> I felt like he, he, I felt like Peter's at times is kind of almost talking, it's almost talking, sometimes he, he gets himself into kind of, he's almost in two different directions there. And he does a lot about talking about truth. And his truth is rather kind of, well, I don't know if I can tell you, there's no source of truth. Or it's kind of something that you do, but you stand for it, you know for you don't know why you stand for truth. And the next minute you say, well, but you, you don't really know anything. Or you have, someone else may know something better. In fact, if you get an argument with your past, you better, it's more important to see truth than to be right. But truth stands for right. So it's kind of like, what, 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 is the, what, what, what is he doing? Or is he back to the kind of, well, whatever's going to make, make your life go better, that's what you, that's where you, that's really what you, that's really what's behind it there. And yep. Truth is just a, a method, just a, a method of a better life. It's the method, these are all methods of a, it's put, you're using, divine truth or, 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 or mythological truth. And you lose a lot of this for, for some other, for some secular end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is Peterson aware that he's using evolutionary biology as a myth? Yeah, I, th I think he's quite, he's, he's been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. He's only just now been discovered. But you can find videotapes of him doing this in the 90s and his, his arguments are mostly there already. And Maps of Meaning was published in 99. Can, can you, uh, one of the things that I didn't understand reading through the book is, what does he mean by being with a capital B? <laughs> That's Heidegger. Yes, it's right. yeah, I, I really Just look at Heidegger. So, so, so in, a, in a sense, part of what Christians one way that Christians sometimes use this word God 
is in the New Testament when we'll say something like he's all in all. Being with a capital B is, in a sense, you know, the fullness of everything right here and right now. Heidecker, of course, with his at-handness. So, so Peterson uses that as, as sort of the, the, you know, the, the most basic comprehensive reality that we experience. Being with a capital B. Actually, if you read C.S. Lewis's Miracles, notice where Lewis capitalizes um, <laughs> reason with a capital R. Lewis often does that same thing, and I think this goes back to Heidegger. So, so, so for Peterson, being is, is finally, again, because he doesn't have sort of a, uh, an end, a, a consummation like a Christian would have, being here in this moment is kind of the all-encompassing now in full richness. That's, it's, it's hard to put this stuff into words. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, there was some comment about truth and the lack of meta-narrative. And um, it might be true for some people that they have to find the meta-narrative and then their own life suddenly makes sense. But I think for many people, they first have to make a little bit of sense of their own little lives um, before they even have interest <laughs> in fitting into a bigger picture, um, especially in very chaotic times. And I think those are the kind of people that he's speaking to, and that the truth that um, the, the chapter in Telling the Truth was the only one I listened to twice. I had the audio book because I just thought it was profound the way he correlated sacrifice and truth to an age that doesn't understand ritual whatsoever. Um, and he brought it down to earth and said, well, actually, we do this all the time when we're just thinking to ourselves, you know, are we going to sacrifice our errors for the truth? Um, and I think honesty might be a better term than truth, since um, you can believe complete nonsense, but you have the choice still to be honest about that with the people around you. Um, well, you, you don't think it's nonsense, but you know it might be in some ultimate truth kind of way. Um, but you can be honest about that, or you can lie about it and, and be a people pleaser. Um, and I think that's the kind of truth that he means, is the, the truth of the here and now, of whoever you are, whatever you're thinking, and being honest with yourself, even if you recognize or the people around you recognize that it might not align with ultimate truth or that ultimate meta narrative that you might at some point um, have enough structure in your own life to align with. Peterson's a lot older, and I, in my experience, I mean, people often want to talk, that, so the Lewis, Peterson and the Christian thing, and then pe people, people want to say, well, Peterson is making his way towards Christianity. That might be the case. Who here made the point that uh, right now he's getting a lot of reward for being right where he's at? Mm -hmm. I could imagine Peterson becoming a Christian, but something's going to have to happen in his life for that type of transformation to take place, I think. And, and, the, and, and the point you were making about um, ritual is, at some point I hope to sit down and have a longer conversation with Jordan Peterson, and the really interesting oddness about his life is for a man who talks so much about symbol and ritual and acting things out. The, the lack of church going is not just a question about tri what tribe he's in, but this is all your stuff. Please tell me how you participate symbolically, ritualistically, liturgically in all of this stuff that you talk about. Because it's kind of interesting that he doesn't, I mean, he, he gets at it with his art in some ways, but that's, that's, that's a question that I'd like to ask him.
Uh, it could be, I mean, he has access to higher status conversation partners now than he had before. There could be, there, there could be movement in some of these ways, but again, I think, especially for him, it's, in my opinion, Christian conversion, as Lewis said, is, is a rebel laying down their arms. It's a surrender at that level. And I think we don't finally surrender often until we're, we find ourselves in a corner. That's my experience. Oh, a lot of hands. Oh, you haven't said anything. I'm wondering um, if you know just some of the impact that he's had in academia in the universities. I think he is having more of an impact than will, than will be publicly seen. I have had a number of, by virtue of doing my YouTube channel, um, I've got a degree of visibility. I've had a number of interesting conversations with academics who uh, won't fess up to following him or finding his work productive. James, had a, James is a very courageous man who works in academia. He made a proposal. Tell us about the proposal you made to your school, James, and how that went over. I propose that we, as a college, utilize 12 Rules for Life as our book that is shared across curriculums to create a unified dialogue, um, thinking that it touched on multiple fields and that it spoke to um, seeking truth and uh, they removed it from the selection process, saying that it didn't meet the guidelines for our college. Did they mention any particular guidelines that it didn't meet? <laughs> that would have been wonderful. Politically <laughs> yeah. correct. Huh? But um, no, it was surreptitiously removed without comment. So much for clarity. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think in terms of academia, I think he, I think people don't want to touch him because they're going to lose status. Oh. Yes, Philip. Uh, I was just wondering, I assume that the meaning of myth is falsehood or illusion or something is a secondary meaning. That, yes. that, do you know when approximately in time that developed? Because it seems that Harris totally is focused on that, almost like that's God number two, and myth in the more creative, real sense is God number one. And there's also kind of a strange parallel of Gnosticism with like the Demiurge and you know so forth. And Gnosticism having corrupted just about everyone in the 20th century, academically at least. Um, I, I wondered about the myth. Um. I, I don't know. I don't know when that second meaning of the word came into vogue. I would assume probably after the Enlightenment. You can. I would as well. Because you can practically see them like not quite grasping that they're using the word differently. Yeah. Are, 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 are Harris is always trying to spin the ball. Aaron next, and then the gentleman with the uh, blue shirt. All of what he was saying, I, I actually think uh, Peterson is quite aware of, I think he actually is familiar with both sides of that. Um, but he's, for reasons you mentioned earlier, are staying in that uh, tension. Because that's, uh, because a lot of metaphors use bridges, frontiers, uh, conversation, partner, um, you need to be there. You can't put on a jersey on one side, it's then it's inaccessible. You mentioned um, the uh, different organizations in, the, in, in, in faith who try and knock on that door and try and you know, get through that door because, and they literally wear uniforms. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, Harris for me is a, a bit dogmatic. Um, which is interesting. And I, I first learned about Harris from like, watching a video long ago about like the four horsemen. You had Daniel Dennett, you had Dawkins, you know, right? And I'm like, who's Harris? Who's this guy? You know, um, it's funny now that he's such a so large on the radar. But I, I think um, just to follow what you're saying, because I think he actually is, Harris is kind of stuck on God number two. To use your terminology, it's a really wonderfully put way of describing it. Because I think. Um, how do you put this succinctly? Um, there are many people who are seeing, I would argue that God number two, number one is much bigger than God number two. And God number two is very low hanging fruit. It's quite fashionable to take punches at him. 
it's a little, it's it's easy. You know, you make fun of the fool who's religious. You don't take on the well-trained, you know, priest. You might get knocked out. You know, it's um, anyway. I'm not saying Harris is deliberately paranoid, um, but he's just so used to taking on those sort of um, that characterization. Does that make sense? He's made a career out of it. Yes. Nobody's mentioned the thing that came through most strongly to me when I read this book, which is this. I thought that the main point that I got from it, in a way, was that the balance between the masculine and the feminine in our society <laughs> had been completely shifted in the wrong direction. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's, that's very strong in the book. And, and, and in fact, when, oh, I don't know if that's, in the Australia trip I made, um, one woman, she said she almost didn't get past that first reference of um, the, the relationship between chaos and feminine. Uh, she, she almost didn't get past that. But that's, that's very true and that's very right and that is, a very, um, that is a very big point in the book. And I think I was, I've been watching, well now I'm going to get in trouble. I've been watching the Synod of the Christian Reformed Church this week and I think this is the, safety, this is the safetyism synod and there's a very strong feminine ethos. They're worrying about safety. Can we have watchers and guardians and rules and protections to keep everybody safe? Safety is a very important thing. That's in a sense the, the feminine. The masculine is mission. Will we go out? Will we conquer? Will we take new territory? And it's... Ride skateboards. Yes, you ride skateboards. That's right. That's an excellent point. Yeah, go, go. I'll, I'll let uh, Ali talk about that. He's been listening to a lot of Harris lately. Go ahead, Ali. As a bigger fan of Harris, I would say his mission is to um, incorporate uh, meditation mm -hmm. as he learned from a lot of Buddhist gurus and the time he spent in, uh, in the East into a more uh, secular perspective. And he's trying to teach people that you can actually enjoy the benefits of spirituality and all the good things that come from it without the burden of having to um, believe something based on bad evidence. I mean, they, they actually... Fit So I would say no briefly. Um, um, lack of free will and transcendence of self are actually the two sides of the same coin. And what Harris uh, tries to get people to uh, accept is that once you get to a position, um, a state of consciousness where you no longer identify with the self, which is absolutely compatible with accepting lack of free will, you actually access higher states of consciousness that can help you be a better person in the future or um, live a better life in the future. And they're, they're actually two sides of the same point. But isn't the idea there's no free will an idea that you choose? Well, then in that sense, you, you can right. say that someone who doesn't believe in free will doesn't get to choose. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> why, would, why would Harris write a book to convince people the other people's views are determined that they have no free will. Uh, well, uh, and if Harris's views are determined, the whole thing uh, has so, no uh, his, uh, I think, um, have you read his book, Free Will? I've read parts of it, but the idea, Dawkins uh, so, uh, the same problem. So he's, he's, a, he's not a proponent of fatalism, he's a proponent of determinism. Fatalism would be this, uh, God or whatever set the clock and then now everything can be calculated and we don't get to choose anything. But determinism is actually compatible with, say, uh, randomness at the quantum level. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, what he uh, says is that you don't get to choose the thoughts or the actions that you take. But yeah, it saying, doesn't mean that those thoughts and actions are actually determined. Yeah, but what I'm saying is he is a, he's, he's inferring certain things. He is 
asserting certain things as a truth. Okay? Like what? You have what you just said, right? So if you assert something as being truth, that means there's some objective standard you're comparing to another idea. So you have to have free will to make the comparison. So the idea that you have no free will itself is an admission that you have free will. And as Alan Planning would point out, for example, that no inference can be made without a tautological assumption that you have free will. There's no way around it. There's no backing out of that tautologically necessary point that you have free will. And I think that's part of what Peterson is also getting at, because Peterson is saying that if you are this uh, materialist, essentially. Everything that you claim is you're denying that you're materialist. Because ideas exist independent of matter, and you're choosing those ideas. Uh, well, this is a much longer conversation. But <laughs> in, in short, I would say that um, materialism has, uh, has been maybe simplified in the culture. Uh -huh. uh, when someone says that they're materialist, they're not saying that they don't have a conscious experience. Like for instance, they're not denying that their experience as a state of consciousness is not real. Because <laughs> consciousness is subjectively irreducible for each one of us, right? So we can put someone in the lab and uh, study them objectively, but each person cannot reduce their own subjective experience. So I would say uh, calling someone a materialist doesn't mean that they're not identifying that their own experience yeah, the is The person real. in the lab who studies. And this, this goes back to Lewis's uh, work on subjectivism, including the abolition of man. He points out that the conditioner, who is essentially presiding over the study of the person whose consciousness is objective, that person's consciousness is objective too. Right. So there's no, there's no possibility of having science at all. Right. Well, uh, Again, a long conversation, but I would say it's the best that we can manage. Yeah. I, think, I think he's right that there are materialists that don't deny their consciousness, but there are materialists that do deny their consciousness. I think it was in 2017 there was a conference um, meant to determine once and for all that consciousness was an illusion. and. If you think about that for about 30 seconds, <laughs> um, like an illusion is a form of consciousness. That's right, exactly. So it, it disproves its, um, exactly. its tautological, like you said. And that's not what Harris would say. But it, but it is a, it is a little bit of a charade if we're saying that there's no choice, but we're spending a lot of time worrying about our consciousness and raising our consciousness and becoming the person with the personhood as a, as an objective goal, as a as a real goal, a subjective and an objective goal. Aaron, Philip, Mark. So before I try and hit those. It's a pretty tough nut to crack. Um, you had a couple of like follow-on questions on like why is Sam Harris doing? I think a couple of them like why do meditation? Well, I think um, a more practical level, um, it's well, it's been pretty well studied now that meditation is quite good for you. I mean, basically, so he's, in some sense, he's not unlike uh, Jordan Peterson. It's like these things work. Um, they help people in entire societies. Maybe not at the level of sort of the argument that um, uh, Paul's making is the uh, Western civilization has been able to reach some really good heights. But there's also an Eastern tradition that's it's a lot of people. Like if you were to put this, the locus of humanity, like if you were not drawn on the map but you just had a number of people, I mean, somewhere like in India, right? So some of these traditions have worked quite well for people for a while. And Harris is saying, yeah, well, we measure in the lab, people are calmer, more focused. Yeah. I mean, we're in Silicon Valley area. There's a lot of CEOs meditating. They schedule it in their super tight schedule. Mm -hmm. Like, don't do too much, right? So that's a low hanging, uh, I think, in, in a more practical side. I think Harris is focusing on that sort of stuff.
so uh, on your last point, uh, through meditation, you can actually get to a non-dualistic state of experience, mm -hmm. where, uh, and I'm talking out of experience, I'm not just reading a textbook, you can experience a state of consciousness where center drops out of your experience, mm -hmm. and you truly experience that non-dualism. But it's something that you gotta, and it's, uh, if, as a Christian, maybe, uh, if you've had any experience of like being in the presence of God or feeling rapture, it's pretty much the same experience. Mm -hmm. It's very joyful, but you can actually get there without any sort of superstition or, or religion. Mark, maybe a plug for maps of meaning. I think when Peterson is at the beginning trying to talk about Russian behaviorist degree and rats in the lab, a part of this by the title the way in which highly advanced rational creatures um, order and map the universe is a fundamental <coughs> flaw in this probably not only intramural scientific community debate, but maybe even the broader cultural debate about whether fear and anxiety that's created is simply an objective internal thing, or if it's, um, excuse me, that was, you said that wrong, uh, an internally subjective experience, or there's uh, objective content to the way in which, you know, the chaos of not only someone's dog coming in and, you know, oh, now we know whose it is and what's happening. Uh, he makes this argument and that's a meaning about, it's, it's not actually the behaviorist theory that, well, you're messing with the, the rat who was stable and your experiment is the problem. It's actually that we are constantly as creatures in the state of trying to map and measure and find balance and that, that natural habitat psychologically is what is almost irrefutable now scientifically. And I think this is a fascinating conversation then about how the role of um, the awareness of the self plays into these um, not only mythological but even religious conversations. Um, and what do we mean when we talk about the freedom of a personal will or um, you know, things being purely material? I think. Uh, Maps of meaning is tough. Please keep uh, helping us as you chew on it, Paul, because um, there's, there's a lot there, but I think this subjective objective debate, um, I think Peterson has more to offer to that um, argument that's helpfully going on. Well, and the Scruton conversation was yeah. good on a lot of that stuff, too. Um, one of the early clips from that I used quite a bit, uh, just in terms of we're... I mean, it's, it's quite bizarre the way our minds work, it's way, the way we so naturally see ourselves in this room full of other people and map this so naturally. There's a lot going on that, in terms of a lot, we're bringing into the experience of receiving that we're simply not aware of. Um, Philip. Uh, this goes back a little bit in the conversation, but it, 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 it strikes me, having been in the Bay Area for 20 years and been involved with... Vedanta and Buddhism and things like that, as well as Christianity. I, I've noticed in the Four Horsemen or whatever type of area, although I'm not that familiar with them, that there's still kind of this weird sanctimonious affect, like when they start talking about meditation and things, like somehow this is just shrouded in this like gooey light of cozy happiness that is entirely adapted from other spirit, uh, religious forms. Um, in uh, uh, ideas have consequences. Richard Weaver makes a point about like religion. It it, it has power to bind. You know, religio, and the, the people who are always doing the spirituality thing are very much averse to commitment. You know, I mean, Weaver doesn't make that, but I think that's a logical extrapolation. Um, another kind of loose point I was going to make was that in I think orthodoxy, or else in heretics. But I think it's orthodoxy. Charles Chester makes a point about like London having developed in say 1908 to the point at which somebody in London can doubt that London exists. And I don't think that somebody like Paris, who sees himself as a hero, can quite see that he doesn't see things as a decline over history. He sees it as an ascension away from the past. So it's, it's very interesting how these conditioned teleologies like totally control the the grounds of the discussion. Well, I think part of the the angst that Harris brought to his conversations with Peterson was nobody, nobody, 
your hatred of a traitor is, is doubly passionate. And so we were supposed to be marching towards rationality and away from superstition. And here comes Peterson and he blows up. And I was going to have a reference to a, a, another video by a guy named Mouthy Buddha, which basically walked through, you know, why is Jordan Peterson eating Sam Harris's fan base? It seems like Jordan Peterson has gained at Sam Harris's expense. And that history is supposed to go one way. And so actually, I had some very interesting conversations with a number of uh, atheists, including Peter Bogosian, who one of the things that happened in the atheist community was a big split between Sam Harris, Peter Bogosian, and then this whole group of atheists that have very much gone on the social justice warrior platforms. And so that's, I had no awareness of it until the hoax this, the hoax papers with James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose came out. But there's a huge fight going on right now in the Church of Atheism over this stuff. And um, it's, it's, I had no knowledge of that at all. Just like they don't know the, the, they don't know the little fights within the Christian Reformed Church. So. What, what is this fight? Can you give me like the, the elevator pitch of what they're, what they're fighting about? There, there was, well, it's a fight over science. Science is supposed to continue to ascend and remove all superstition. And now you've got an argument that, well, science is the fruit of patriarchy. Science is the fruit of white supremacy. So you've got classes in Africa that are saying the sciences that, ha that have been given us are, the, are the, basically the stories of our oppressors sent to oppress us. And so we have to deconstruct this science. And of course, someone like Sam Harris, uh, uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, Peter Bogosian, they look at this and they're saying, oh my goodness, they're giving up the crown jewels. <laughs> and that's a furious fight right now. And that's what led to the hoax. It's part of what led to the hoax papers. Well, Lewis, Lewis uh, I think that, that quote says something along the lines that for science to exist, the, uh, the scientist's own views cannot be determined by the system that he or she is analyzing. Right. Right. And so if, you, if mm -hmm. you have this reductionist view in this postmodern, which is what Peterson's attacking, of course you're going to end up with this view, so-called post-normal science, mm -hmm. right? That <coughs> there is no science is meaningless and it's just a tool of oppression. And mm -hmm. Of course, the idea of oppression itself, where does that come from? I mean, it, it's just... Incoherence. Well, there's the moralism, yeah. the moralism, be, there's a moralism yeah. behind my relativism. Yeah. yeah. What is uh, so? So we were talking about what does C.S. Lewis, what would C.S. Lewis think of Jordan Peterson? What does Jordan Peterson think of C.S. Lewis? <laughs> I I asked him that question. A number of people have asked him that question. He um, he has referenced the trilemma. Sewett Lewis's famous trilemma, and Peterson found that quite persuasive and used that in a conversation. I don't think Lew Peterson has referred to Lewis as a Christian apologist. Now, many of us in this room would say, well, he's certainly that, but he's a lot more. I, I don't know that Peterson has taken the time to look into Lewis at the level that a lot of people in this room have. Has, just a moment, has, has Peterson at all addressed this idea of, you know, the cart before the horse, the myth versus the outcome, and, and that kind of thing, or versus myth as the ultimate reality. Has he addressed that at all in Lewis's stuff? No, I don't. Not that I've heard. I mean, that would be the question I'd like to hear. Answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I, I think, you know, I, in very simple terms, I, I think that's that for me is the key difference between a person like Lewis and a person like Peterson. Peterson is missing what I would call Mark can help me out here. The auto factor. This, this, he uses the word transcendence, but he's not talking about the same thing that Rudolf Otto talks about. Right, right. And, and so, and I think, I think that would be a wonderful way to engage Peterson via Otto and, and of course, Lewis, the beginning of the problem of pain, the numinous. Do we have a faculty um, to, that, by which we apprehend the numinous? just like we seem to have a faculty with respect to morality. And, you know, so we have our five senses. 
And so, and that gets into the question of meaning. Is meaning simply an experience that I produce by chemicals in the brain? Or is meaning something that I participate in and sense? It's outside of myself. Can we, can we have one more? Let the myth invade our lives. Right. Which is young, again. Yeah, one more question. James. Um, thinking of the question before about what would, what would Jordan Peterson think of C.S. Lewis, how would you expect him to think through the trilemma of C.S. Lewis, even with the language he uses about Christ as the archetypal perfect person? Yeah, I, I don't know. Because he, it's always important to remember Peterson as a Jungian, and that comes through often. But the context in which he referred to the trilemma was sort of a throwaway comment, but he... he he, he, he said it, and he said, I don't know a way around this. That's what he said. But again, right, but the, the thing is, again, when people look at, well, is Peterson a Christian, or will he become a Christian? Again, my, part of my conviction about Christian conversion is sometimes we creep up to it and find ourselves over the line. Sometimes, like Lewis, you know, England's most reluctant convert. <laughs> so I want to thank um, Paul for his leadership. <laughs>